Hey everybody, good afternoon and welcome to the Landlord Coach Daily Show. It is so good to see you. I hope you had an amazing weekend. The weather was absolutely amazing. I got out to go a little bit uh, kayaking a little bit this weekend and spent some time with my awesome bride. Let's go ahead, I'll tell you a little bit about this on the inside right now. Let's go ahead and kick this off. Let's do this. Drop the needle. Uh, I just love this too much. Okay, so it is good to see you all. Thanks so much for joining me today. It is, uh, it's good to have you, and uh, I appreciate you stopping by and watching the something in front of me, watching the daily, the Landlord Coach Daily Is Show. And I call this the Daily Is Show because, quite frankly, I'm not going to do this every single day. I do it when I have time, and when I really don't, if I don't have anything really to, compelling to say, I'm not going to drag. You people down that road. <laughs> so uh, just as an example, Thursday and Friday, I'm going to be out of the area. I'm going to be uh, at a mastermind group that is um, a mastermind I belong to out of St. Louis. So me and my bride will be there for Thursday and Friday. And then on Saturday, I'm having my hosting my own mastermind group with my own inner circle students and uh, coaching clients. So they will be there and that will be on Saturday. So I've um, got a, a busy week ahead but you will not see me after Wednesday, so feel free to go ahead and not worry about clocking in. I will not be taking attendance on Thursday and Friday. <laughs> so hope you are had. Hope, hope you guys had a, a great and amazing uh, weekend this past weekend. It was, a, it was certainly a busy one for me. It was a little bit crazy. I uh, went out. Uh, we, my my bride and I went out to the club on Saturday. We had a really good time. We spent. Um, I got up, spent uh, way too much time uh, staying up late, and then Sunday went uh, mowed the grass, and then went to, and uh, went kayaking, and um, went down the river, turned around, came up the river, and as I was coming up the river, um, it was starting to get a little bit dark. And this is a true story. This actually happened this way. Uh, so as I'm coming up, I'm, I'm coming upstream now. So I'm paddling upstream, and it's getting getting dark-ish. It's not quite dark yet, but as it's getting dark, I'm coming up, and um, so I was trying to stay close to the shore because the, the the current wasn't so strong right there. But um, I was I got into a school of carp, and the carp were pretty active. They were they were thrashing around in the water, but they were ahead of me. They weren't really wasn't really bothering them too much until one of the carp jumped out of the water and hit the side of the kayak and it startled me so I jumped back this way and I dumped the kayak. Unfreaking believable. Well, yeah, I managed to save, I saved the guns. We're good. We're saved. We saved that. <laughs> so, uh, um, yes, but I lost my phone. So my phone is taking a permanent bath in the Wabash. Eh, whatever. It was only like a couple feet deep, but I really didn't want to be feeling around in the bottom of the Wabash because there's nothing but bricks and bottles and probably needles and all sorts of stuff down there so i just called it even so i had to hustle back and of course i didn't have any way of contacting my brian to let her know i was actually okay but uh yeah so anyway brian shook hello brian i'm still brian is uh he's got honey well he will have honey soon like for real honey so brian i am i'm holding you to it to my uh I'm not going to say quite half gallon of honey, but I use quite a bit of honey. So I'm holding you to it, brother. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> all right. So it's good to see you all. Thanks for joining me today. All right. So what are we going to be talking about today? I, I um, had a, on Saturday, I had a, a, a an event that I was talking with the folks, the really, really amazing good folks down in Broward County, Rhea, the Broward Rhea. Uh, Real Estate Investors Association and uh, Miami Dade Rhea down in Florida. So they were. Um, I was telling them a little bit about the my um, about my course, which is becoming a VIP in the rental business, and um, they had some really really good questions. I mean, some of these questions were absolutely fantastic. And you just tell that they were. Um, they seem to be a slightly younger crowd than I'm usually speaking to, but man, they were just super engaged. Super good folks, and I mean, for those of you who are members of that RIA, man, you guys are on fire. Just keep doing what you're doing. Really, really good questions. 
and I think I had over 80, 85 people at one point uh, in, on a Saturday, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> man, these people are serious. They are not kidding around. And they stuck, I mean, the number wavered a little bit, but I mean, less than less than 5%. I mean, everybody was there and everybody was engaged. Because I was asking them questions and asking them to engage during the, during, the, during the entire thing. It was a little over three hours, like three and a half hours. So it was uh, fantastic. I mean, I really, really appreciate it. But a lot of really good questions came out of that. And that's what I want to talk about today. So for those, um, uh, so for those of you who have um, either rental properties that you're either looking to grow your portfolio, or if you are not in the game yet, and you want to start thinking about buying rent, uh, rental real estate. You're thinking, man, is this the right time? You know, real estate prices are so freaking high; it doesn't really make sense. Well. You, the numbers have to make sense regardless. I mean, if the, if the price is so high and you can't offset it with the with the rent that's coming in, then then it may not make sense. But I'm going to give you some things to think about and to consider if you're looking at rental real estate right now. Now, I'm not saying there's no deals out there. I'm just saying you've got they're not as abundant as it was like in 2010, right? Back when everybody no no one was buying anything because financing was hard to come by and it was just everybody was broke everybody was just trying to survive you know coming out of the great recession so um there's a couple things going on now where people are thinking well is there going to be another real estate recession is it going to i don't i don't think there is i think that the the right now you've got a fundamental issue with undersupply of housing there's there's an undersupply of housing as a result it's making prices go up um and money is cheap and money is very, very cheap. So it's an offsetting equation where you know, if you can buy a cheap house, but if financing is expensive, like back in the 80s, uh, the 1980s, then you know it offsets there. But you know you can always readjust your financing, but it's kind of hard to readjust your purchase price because once your purchase price is set, you know once you buy it, you're kind of stuck with it, right? So there's really no way around that. But you could always refinance something to a lower rate. Now, my argument's always been I want something with the lowest loan constant. Now, what, what's a loan constant? It's a real simple calculation. You can look it up on Google. But I will tell you, it's a really simple calculation. Really what a loan constant is, it's a, it's a percentage, okay? But it's a, it's a, um, it really measures two different loans at, in terms of who has, which loan has the greatest impact on your cash flow. So the highest loan constant has the greatest impact on your cash flow to the uh, negative impact on your cash flow, okay? So um, so given two different loans, if one has a loan constant of 25%, another loan constant has 7%, the one at 25% has the greatest negative impact on your cash flow, okay? So if you're looking to, to uh, you, and you're realizing you're, you're trying to figure out your debt to income, if you're gonna be paying anything off, you need to look at what, what you could pay off, with, which would have the highest impact, the highest negative impact on your cash flow. Um, loan constant is very easy to calculate. You just annualize your payment. So if your payment is $100 a month, you multiply it times 12. So it's $1,200. That's in your annual payment. And you divide your annual payment by your outstanding loan balance. Okay, that's it. It's, it's about as complicated as it gets. And you do the same thing with your, your credit cards, your student loans, anything like that. That's how you calculate loan constant. So whatever amount, whatever loan or whatever burden, financial burden that you have that has a either fixed or adjustable payment, whatever it is. Now, you know, that that's how you measure loan constant. Now, if here, oh, I wanna tell you this. So if you're paying extra, okay, so if you have a $200 loan that you're paying $500 on, right, don't add the, don't do the 500. You want the minimum payment. Because you wanna figure out truly what the, what the absolute payment is in terms of what's which one is costing you the most, you're making just the minimum payments. So I, I get it that you might be paying a thousand dollars a month on your you know your ten thousand dollar outstanding credit card bill. I, I get that, but I'm just looking at minimum payments. So keep in mind this is not measuring interest rate. This is not inter measuring the cost of money. The loan constant is specifically just measuring the impact on your cash flow. Okay, so in, 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 in the negative impact of cash flow based on whatever outstanding debts you have. So all things being equal, and I'm saying all things being equal, I always try to, try to look at paying the things that are the highest loan cost. I want to get that stuff paid off first. On an amortizing loan, which means that the loan is getting paid down over time, on an amortizing loan, that balance of the loan will go down, right? So a $100,000 loan that might have a 5% loan constant, when it gets paid down to $50,000, that 
same because the payment's the same, right? The payment doesn't adjust. From 100,000, it's at 5%. When you get down to 50,000, it's now at 10%, right? Just using back the, mac back the napkin numbers. So I'm just saying, basically, it doubles because you're, you paid off half the loan. The payment has, doesn't, say, doesn't change. So therefore, the, um, the loan constant will be uh, higher as you pay the loans down. That's why it's important to revisit this stuff from time to time, okay? All right, so let me, uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about, um, hey there, Oscar, good to see you. Uh, Oscar is amazing. If you are in the Indianapolis area, man, Oscar is your guy when it comes to mudding and taping. <laughs> we spent a lot of time together, didn't we, Oscar? Uh, he uh, helped me out with a, with a flip I had down in Seymour. So, um, Seymour, Indiana, which is on the market now, and um, please light a candle so that thing gets sold quickly. But it, uh, I've got an accepted offer, but uh, it, we're really excited to turn this house over to to, to this gal. But uh, anyway, I've just still got, got some things to, get to, to uh, finish up there. Anyway, uh, what I want to talk to you about today is this conversation that I was having. Was, does it make sense to buy rental properties today, right? Because the, the, the prices are high. Um, you know, you've got COVID, you've got an election, you've got all this, you know, social unrest, you've got all this stuff going on, right? So that was one of the questions, like, given COVID, you know, should I, you know, wait for all that stuff to come out of it, whatever? Here's the reality. Most of the people who are very liberal, okay, and I'm not making, I'm not painting a broad brush, I'm not trying to make this into a political argument, I'm just saying there's a lot of people who are just kind of like on the far, far, far left that are saying, like, rent should be free, like, you know, housing should be free, people, you know, people shouldn't have to pay anything for basic, you know, basic housing, you know, whatever. Um, I think most people realize how, like, that's just not going to happen. I mean, yes, they do have, you know, things like that, but it's nothing short of prison, okay? Um, and when the government tends to get into anything, especially real related like that, it just doesn't turn out to be very good quality, or it's just so mismanaged that it just doesn't turn out to be the best use of taxpayer money. So, um, as a result, you know, you're looking at, um, you know, the other side of the equation, which is like, okay, well, people should be able to evict people for non-payment and things like that. Well, there's a lot of there's a lot of gray area in the middle right now. We don't want a mass amount of people who are displaced because they can't pay due to COVID, but yet you've you've got other the other side of the equation, which are the landlords, the property owners, who cannot pay their mortgages because they rely on that rental income to come in to, you know, keep the keep the property maintained, pay the bills, pay their mortgages, most you know, that sort of thing. Okay. So there's obviously two very hard extremes and then there's in the middle where everybody just kind of has to suck it up and live with it. Well that has to end. This eviction moratorium stuff has to stop at some point because even though this is a global thing that's going on, you know, we, we have to get to a point where business can resume as normal. We, ha we, ha we are in a republic based on laws and contract law, and if one person is not following through that contract, then, you know, we have to have a remedy. There has to be some sort of legal remedy. Otherwise, you could start making the argument that everybody should have cell phones, that everybody needs a car, that everybody, I mean, it, it, it just, it, it never, never stops. So as a result, I mean, what we're talking about is socialism, right? And that, that means, you know, I, and, and I don't want to get, get into that wormhole, but it's not based on a free market, which is what we are. We are a free market where we get to decide, you know, uh, you know, within legal bounds, who we can rent to and how much we can charge and that sort of thing, okay? And therefore, you know, I price my stuff based on quality. I price my stuff based on location. I price my stuff based on, on what a reasonable return is that I can get and providing a good, a good service to people. Okay. All right. So, with that, um, what what, so that has to come out of it. So I would take COVID out of the equation as it relates to a long term financing hold. All right. So when I look back and I'm sitting here thinking, I'm like, you know what? I I don't think people remember. And I don't remember this because I was too young to know at the time. I'm going to share with you a graph here real fast. Um, if you, I'm going to, um, so if I'm going to, the, the Globe and Mail website is where I got this, this, um, this chart. Um, but if you're looking back and this is, I think that goes all the way back to the early sixties and it comes out to about to, uh, to modern day. 
If you're looking far left, that column there at 6.9%, that's the average five-year mortgage rate. Okay, that's the average. If you see there in the um, late 70s, early 80s, the mortgage rates peaked at 21.5%, right? They've never been that high since. And then they came down, of course, they, they kind of stair-stepped on their way down. And then, um, you know, even even then back in the, the late 80s, mortgage rates were in the, what is that, 14, almost 15%, 14.5% right there. So it was really, really expensive money. I mean, very, very costly money. So then, of course, in the, in the early 90s, things were good. And then it just kind of, it's been coming down ever since. And now we're at historic lows as it relates to the cost of money. So when I look at the the money that is out there and I'm sitting here thinking about it like wow this is this is really hard for me to convey to people you know how good we really have it. And the cost of money, the cost of funds are really really low right now. So when I look at the uh when people are talking about wanting to borrow money and and I'm I'm I am okay with debt as long as it's going to help you serve a purpose. Getting into debt to get into an investment vehicle, but if that vehicle, I don't want to stay in debt forever. I want to get debt, get out of debt as quick as possible so it delivers my my closely held vision. Okay, that's another topic for another day perhaps, but what I'm saying is if if I want to, if, if my, the, the hill I'm ready to die on is that I want to work uh, only, you know, 20 hours a week and um, so I can go on vacation uh, every six months with my with my family and homeschool my kids. If those are the if those are the three things that that's the hill I want to die on. That I want to I want to that's the most important things to me. That I want to know what's going to cost to fund that. Okay, that's why I'm not I'm debt averse as a, as as long as I'm able to deliver that vision. Then fine, go ahead leverage up whatever else you want. But I don't want to be I don't want that cash flow to be leveraged because look at it right now. If I was fully leveraged across all my properties and and I was having the 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 eviction problems that people are having right now where they're trying to live on their on their rent payments, there's people who right now who are retired and they are flat on their back. They have no they have no options because even if they're not leveraged, they may not they may have residents that are living there that have no ability to pay. Okay? So Leverage, of course, increases that risk. Now, if you do have leverage and you're using your money well, that means you can hold debt and cash, right? And use your cash well, use your cash, be highly defensive with your cash, using it properly, using it well, then you could be okay right now, right? You could be funding, you could be paying yourself out of that cash and that cash flow, you know, or, or and substitute that for the cash flow until it comes back. That is not a bad strategy. On, on, on a balance sheet perspective, you still have about the same amount of leverage, right? So if you're, you know, if you're fully leveraged at hundred thousand dollars, but you have a hundred thousand in cash, it's basically the, it's the same thing, right? But the problem is because we get stuck on st- stuck on dumb. Again, ask me how I know. <laughs> we spend all that hundred thousand, and then we still have that hundred thousand dollars in debt. Okay, so that's why I say I, I tend to be risk averse or debt averse when it comes to that sort of stuff. So the reason why I want to bring this up is I want to I want to use that the mortgage rates. The reason why people like to get into into rental real estate specifically is because it tends to be a hedge against inflation. Now I'm going to show you another chart here and I will put the um, this came from the Consumer Price Index Bureau of Labor Statistics. If you're looking at the price inflation for rent of primary residence since 1984. So this is a little this is only up until the early 80s, the, the graph from before went back into the 60s. But you'll see here that the pricing of rent was in, it, it was roughly a little over 6% back in 1985. And you'll see how this base, the, the rents go up and down based on the amount of inflation in the, uh, that was being measured by this consumer price index. So, it is a hedge against inflation, and that's the thing that people often forget that, okay, well, it's, yeah, it's a hedge against inflation, but does that mean that, okay, that it's it's automatic? No, you have to actively manage your properties, which means that if you're having a, you know, a $1,000 rental today, okay, then you, you, know, you have to be 
pay attention. You have to do your analysis. You have to do your due diligence. 120 days, 150 days, whatever it is, you have to do your due diligence prior to the renewal of the lease and you have to pay attention, especially in what I'm going to be calling an inflationary environment, which is in my estimation somewhere between 7 to 10 percent. By back of the napkin math, I'm just saying that that's what I believe it's going to be if it's not already here. And I believe inflation is already on us. The reason it's not being talked about in the media is because we are being distracted by an election. We're being distracted by social injustice. We're being distracted by all these other things and low fuel prices. So we're not really out there screaming about how expensive stuff is, how much more expensive a you know, a roll of toilet paper or a dozen eggs is today compared to what it was four months ago. It's because we're being distracted. I'm not saying it's but it's on purpose. I'm not this grand, you know, conspiracy guy. <clears throat> I'm just saying that's the reality. Is we are being distracted. So yes, I think the end and the era of historically low rates of inflation is past us. I think we're already that ship has already sailed. I think we're pregnant with that. So what I'm saying is if you're actively managing your properties the way that you should be, then um, then it's not going to be this big, oh my gosh, I have to raise the rent $200 on a $1,000 a month rental because all of a sudden property taxes are more expensive, um, insurance rates are more expensive, maintenance is more expensive. You know, the, the guy who you're paying to mow your grass, all of a sudden his costs are higher, so he has to charge you more, et cetera, et cetera. That way you can keep up with the rate of inflation, but you have to be actively managing it, whether it's you managing the property or you're paying a property manager to do it. Okay. All right. Um, so that's all I have. There's one other thing I wanted to share with you today. So let me answer the question first. So is now a good time to invest? Yes. I do believe it is, but the numbers still have to work. So I want to share something with you. Um, I will put it in the show notes, but if you would like a free download on how to manage rental, or not how to manage, but how to uh, analyze rental properties for purchase, um, I've put together a free download, which is uh, landlordcoach.com forward slash five, the number five, uh, not spelled out, but the number five mistakes. So it's landlordcoach.com forward slash five mistakes. And uh, you can get that and it will get... um, um, that will put you that that'll get you the download. If you don't get it, you can just drop me an email. There's any, my email will be in there, and you can just email me and say, "Hey, dude, I didn't get it." Sometimes it, it will land in your spam. I will promise you, it will land in your spam. That does put you also on my mail list, uh, my email list. So if you don't want that, you can always unsubscribe. You'll not hurt my heart. I I get it. I get a ton of emails, so I do, if you don't want your email inbox clogged up, um, you uh, you can certainly unsubscribe. Um, but one other thing, it was really cool. I was on my way to lunch, and I, I wanted to share this one quick story before I wrap up today. So uh, I was on my way to having lunch with my bride today because it was grilled cheese o'clock, and I make some awesome grilled cheese sandwiches, slice of avocado, a little bit of tomato. Oh, it's like a license to print money. Anyway, I'm sitting there in traffic, and, and I'm like, you know, they're, they're holding up traffic in both directions. And I was sitting there. I was watching these guys with this road crew um, and they were what they were doing was they were putting bicycle um, logos on the side of the road, right? So they're putting it's like a bicycle lane, bicycle lane, and then they put a little arrow and they're putting the yeah, and these things come in pieces. I didn't realize I thought like it was just one big bicycle, but no, they have to actually construct it. It was actually kind of kind of cool, but it was really interesting because these guys there's three of them and they were like out there with tape measures. I mean, they're measuring it from the side of the road. It's not like it's a hard edge. I mean, it's the side of the road, which is jagged at best and they're measuring it and they're moving a little bit and they're you know they're trying to you know gauge the distance between you know, what was the exact middle and they're you know making sure it's square and plumb and all this other stuff and i was just like man they're laying down yeah granted this bicycle thing is going to be there forever because you know it's not like it's going to get a lot of traffic driven over it but these guys were at, i mean they were 100 percent over it. and i got a i got a photo of this guy this is after they had already laid the um uh the 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 thing down and this guy's you know heating it up so it actually stays there but it was really interesting because uh um i i hollered out the window i said man i never thought something like that was so complicated he's like no we just want to make sure that it's uh that it's straight and and uh put it down well so it's really interesting as it relates to that you know what it, it made me think of abraham lincoln's quote whatever you are be a good one so true All right, that's all I have today. You guys have been amazing, and we are going to send you guys off 
Please remember, if you don't have place a value on your free time, someone else will. But most important, there is no amount of money that will make time irrelevant. Have a great rest of your day, and I will see you next time. Bye.